Uh, my name is Paula Geraldo. My pronouns are she, hers. And I will be one of your co-facilitators today for today's meeting, which is Effective Meeting Facilitation, uh, brought to you through the Community Health Training Institute, funded by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. We are excited to bring you this free training, and we hope that you'll leave it with the knowledge to exercise new practices for effective meeting facilitation. So just some uh, housekeeping before we start. For those who have to leave the training early, please message our tech helper, Victoria, so that she can send you our evaluation link. Um, please don't leave without getting the, the evaluation link. Our, our, your feedback really matters to us. Um, it really helps keep, the, keep these um, trainings going. So now I'll pass it off to uh, my amazing co-facilitator, Gina San Inocencio, so she can introduce herself. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Really excited to be with you all today. My name is Gina San Inocencio. I use the she, her pronouns, and I serve as an associate director here at Health Resources in Action, which is sort of in partnership with the Department of Public Health to bring you CHGI. So I'm really excited to be here, um, and I'll pass it to the team to say hello. So I'll pass it to Allison. Hi everyone, my name is Allison Shifley. I use the she, her pronouns. I'm an associate director at Health Resources in Action and the new CHTI director. So I'm kind of taking over from Gina, but we're so excited that she's here facilitating today. Um, and I'll pass it to Victoria. Hi everyone, I'm Victoria. Um, I'm the admin coordinator at CHTI and I'll be helping with tech today. Um, I use the she, her pronouns. Um, definitely message me if you need anything. Um, and I'm excited to be here with you all today. And I'll pass it back to Paula. Thanks, everyone. All right, so let's get started. Uh, make sure that uh, you have some water with you. You're good, good to go, and let's go. So next slide, please. All right, so this is a virtual training. We're just going to do some virtual uh, housekeeping again, just to be sure we're all on the same page here. Um, on the bottom left corner we have the mute button just make sure that you are muted when you're not speaking um, just so that there's no disruptions we would love it if you could have your videos on that way everyone is more engaged everyone is present um, you can see who is a participant in the bottom middle here and you can add questions or comments to the chat if you click on the chat button in the bottom middle as well um, you can um, on the top right, you can see the speaker view here. You can change that depending on what you would like to see. And um, that's pretty much it. So let's move on to the next slide. So we will be utilizing Zoom breakout rooms today. And um, this is just some information, some background information if you haven't used the breakout room before on Zoom. Um, we will be assigning you to a room and um, the host is the only one who can move you in and out of them. So um, that's something you don't have to worry about. Before it's time to come back, we will be broadcasting a message that pops up at the top of your screen and we'll give you a 60 second warning before being everyone's brought back so you don't get like randomly jerked out of your, out of your rooms and you can finish the conversation. Uh, you can leave the room at any time if you want by clicking leave breakout room in your control panel, I believe it's at the bottom bottom right of your screen, um, if you have a question for us or anything like that. And um, when in the rooms, you will have like the full control panel similar. You can mute, turn your camera on, things like that, do, uh, send stuff in the chat, whatever you need to do. Next one. If you are not able to join our meeting um, via your desktop or your um, phone data, you can also call in. Um, you'll see when you, um, you can you can join by phone. There's, um, I believe it's with, what is it, participants? You can like, yeah, have the, um, if you go to participants, it'll sh it'll give you the opportunity to see the invite, and that'll sh give you a bunch of phone numbers that you can call into um, for this meeting. You'll put in the meeting ID and the um, meeting pin, which is 2671, in order to fully enter this meeting. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So with that out of the way, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this uh, training today. So we have our learning objectives, which are to identify key elements of an effective meeting, 
to articulate best practices for creating and facilitating a meeting agenda, and to identify strategies that you intend to implement to lead effective meetings. Next slide. Okay, so uh, for the agenda today, what we have is, um, you know, what we're doing right now, the welcome and introductions. Uh, we'll be following that up with approaches to facilitation, asking ourselves what makes a good facilitator, um, creating a little packing list of um, what you need to do uh, to set yourself up for a really great productive meeting. And we'll finish it up with some scenarios and challenges in facilitation. Next slide. Okay. Uh, for this slide, I'm going to want some volunteers. So um, please raise your hand. Um, to help me read some group agreements. Um, for the first one, can I have a volunteer? Christine, I see you. Hey there. Um, if you can, leave your camera on. Thank you. Actually, do you want to just read all of them? Sure. Mute yourself if you're not speaking. Take space, make space. Respect others and yourself. Take care of yourself. Thank you so much, Christine. So when we're, you know, some of these are pretty self-explanatory. Others like take space, make space, for example. Um, for me, that means please take space. Like, please talk. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear you in the space. But we don't only want to hear one person, right? We want to hear a collective amount of voices. So please make space for other people to also speak. Um, and lastly, take care of yourself. That means if you have to take a bathroom break, if you have to go get water, um, feed yourself, your dog needs to go out for a second, like, you know, do what you have to do in order for you to come back and be present in the space because we would love for your full, your full participation, your full being here. Awesome. Oh, thank you, Christine, again, and we'll move on. Okay. So we're moving on to our breakout room activity. So we're going to put you in small groups. And in those groups, we would love for you to share your name, your pronouns, if you like, your organization, where you're coming from, and just spend a few minutes talking about what you think an effective meeting looks like. And when is the last time you went to a meeting that felt like it was effectively run? All right. So and when we come back, we're going to have one or two people. Um, kind of share for their group in the out loud, or you can also share in the comments. And Victoria just put the um, discussion criteria in the in the chat so that you can have it. All right, so we're gonna put you in breakout rooms right now. Um, I hope you all had very productive uh, breakout sessions. Now, would anyone like to share either in the comments or preferably out loud? Um, what you talked about, anything that resonated with you. Um, what was the last meeting that you went to that felt effective? Brian, go ahead. All right. Um, so something that we spoke about um, at length was the idea of following the agenda. Um, you know, whoever's facilitating the meeting, making sure to politely uh, redirect folks and make sure that we're staying on task. Um, another thing we talked about is, you know, this idea of a full day of meetings where you almost don't feel like you got anything done because the meetings themselves were longer than they needed to be, or it could have been an email. Um, I, I myself find that, uh, I haven't had an effective meeting in my new role just yet. I'm relatively new to it. Um, but the most effective meetings I've had are the ones that are scheduled for an hour and end after a half hour, you know, and early because you're on time and, and being timely. I love those meetings. <laughs> I think that a lot of us don't really experience them a lot, but, you know, that's why we're here to hopefully expand the reach of people who, who can have those meetings. Anyone else? So I see in the chat, um, facilitator time management and expectations. Um, so setting expectations 
like what are we going to get discussed today? What are we going to get done? And and meeting those, um, and time management always a, a huge one. I think that those are. I think that nobody likes to feel like their time is being wasted, right? So, that is hopefully something that will will um. That I mean, it is going to be something that we're all going to get out of this today. Um, yeah. And so with that said, oh, we have here more kinetic slash inter interactive activities. Um. Madeline, would you like to come up um, and talk more about kinetic activities? Um, sure. So, I mean, it's hard. This mainly applies to in-person meetings, but like, um, you know, like an easy example that I think we've all done at least once is like, we're going to say a statement and go to this corner of the room or that corner of the room uh, to give your opinion about it and see where we are standing as like a team or as like um a group of teams um we also have done some like interesting stuff where we've used like red yellow and green stickers to rate um for example like the example we did was like resources that we refer to and actually like figuring out what we're aware of versus what we are genuinely consistently referring to um in our case management systems um and that really helped us reflect also what's going on in how do we present the information online so a lot of these things got people moving got people feeling like empowered like their voice was being heard but then also created like legitimately quantifiable d uh, data not just um qualitative data and like notes mm -hmm. from the meeting yeah, it's something to reflect back back on in addition to everything. I love that. Um and I think that, you know, coming up in the coming up in the future for in-person trainings as well as in previous in-person trainings, we have had experiences like that. So, I'm glad that um that we bring those up. So, without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Gina to continue with the first section of our um training today. Wonderful. Thank you all so much and thank you Paula. I think you all hit the nail on the head. That's exactly all the things that we're going to be talking about today, ways that we can incorporate some of those practices so that we can make our meetings most effective, especially when we're the one in front of the room, when we're the ones leading in these spaces. Um, I'm just curious, like for those of you that are here today, um, how many of you would say that you're like facilitating pretty regularly every day, every other day, just kind of leading meetings, kind of a show of hands. All right. Um, other folks, what, what's your meeting cadence like, or what are you, how many meetings are you leading, um, if at all? Curious. You feel free to come off mute or add it to the chat box. Two to three a month, depending. Okay, that's good. Awesome. I think one thing for us to think about too, in terms of setting the container for today as well, is just like good facilitation is good facilitation. So if you've come to one of our trainings before, a lot of the things that you're going to hear today are things that we've said before. Um, so this uh, training in particular is geared towards folks that are not doing facilitation as regularly and would love to put more tools in their toolbox, learn some more skills, but can also be seen as a really good refresher if you used to do facilitation and haven't done it in a while or just want to be in a room with other facilitators and learn from one another, really kind of hear the tips and tricks um, from people that are also doing it in the same field. Um, so I appreciate you all kind of coming today and having this conversation with us. So let's think about this a little bit. Um, when we think about what comes to mind when you think about facilitation, what, what do you think about when you hear the word facilitation? Feel free to add it in the chat box. When someone says they're a facilitator or they're going to facilitate something, what comes to mind? They're a guide. Okay. I like that one. What else? Agenda setter. Absolutely. Agenda keeps coming up. It's important. Standing on task, ensuring all members are included. Staying on task. <laughs> Staying, standing. I get it. <laughs> Organized conversation, absolutely. Presenting, 
kind of being the person standing in front of the room, elicit information, discussion, decision-making processes, ensuring following a specific direction, summing up themes. These are all really important things and exactly um, what we're going to be talking about today. So if we go to the next slide, if we think about the word facilitation, um, the first part of the word is Latin and it means facile or easy. So it's just really making the process easier. Whatever you're facilitating or standing in front of the room to help facilitate, you're just thinking about what are ways that we can make this easier to get to our goal or to get to the sort of end of the agenda. What are we trying to accomplish in this space and how can I make that process a little bit easier as someone that's standing up here as a facilitator? So what are some things that we can do as facilitators to make it easier and to make these meetings effective so it doesn't feel like, oh, this just could have been an email, right? So what are some things that we need to think about? We can go to our next slide. And if any questions come up for you or any thoughts or, or things that you wanna share throughout any of these next few slides, cause it'll just be me kind of going over some of the information, feel free to raise your hand, to unmute yourself or to drop stuff in the chat box. We want you to start engaging with this content um, as, as it is helpful for, for your learning as well. So elements of a good meeting, you all shared a lot of this when you did your uh, breakout rooms, right? In your conversations, you wanna create a welcoming environment. Um, and that's something that you want to be really thoughtful and intentional about. So when we think about trainings like this, where we want people to come in um, and feel welcome and kind of feel ready, we try to ease you into the process a little bit. We always build in a five minute buffer um, just to allow folks to arrive. Having online meetings for me is still just kind of... Um, a tough process sometimes, especially at 9.30 in the morning or 10 o'clock, whenever we started, I jumped on at 9.30. <laughs> but 10 o'clock in the morning when folks are like still getting their coffee, their breakfast, maybe you're making your way to the office, maybe you're working from home today, just kind of letting you, giving you just a few minutes to settle in this space. Um, we also try as much as we can and as tech allows us to, to share music, right, as, as folks are coming in. So we had some lo-fi kind of vibes going on just this background so it's not complete silence. Um, again, we just find that it's really helpful to, to have something to fill the space a little bit as folks are trickling in to our meeting. So thinking about your own environment, are you doing online meetings? Are you doing in-person meetings? What are you doing to really uh, help people feel welcome as they walk into the space? Are you offering food? Are you setting up the chairs and tables in a particular way? Have you even thought about having a greeter in your space to welcome as folks are coming in? So things for you to consider as you start to put together um, your meeting agenda. Um, and then we're talking about meeting elements. When we started our training today, uh, Paula went over some group agreements. We see that as a best practice, right? This is that idea of setting up expectations. What are folks coming into? How are they holding themselves accountable to the container that you're creating? Particularly if you're meeting with a group over and over and over again, having them give input on those agreements or those ground rules, um, whatever it is that you call them, those are really important to get by in from your people, right? The people that are coming into this space, they want to know that their voice is valued and that they matter. And being able to set up that right at the beginning is a really an important piece, I think, for, for having a good meeting space with folks. Um, and then the other thing that we try to do um, for all of our meetings, most importantly for those that are uh, groups that are reoccurring are pluses and deltas, or just another way to collect feedback. So we do that in these sessions um, by way of feedback form. So you can tell us what worked, what didn't work, what you thought about the content and the trainers. Um, and we do that anonymously. We want to hear from you because we, as much as we can, we take that feedback and then try to implement it on the trainings that we have uh, moving forward. So being able to collect that feedback from your folks that you're meeting with regularly, um, can be really helpful so you can adjust as you move along um, when you're when you're uh, having meetings and, and, and working with your folks um, so that you can really implement, okay, maybe I could have tweaked this activity or this particular agenda item. Or it's really helpful when, to, when folks feel like things are working and going well, you can be like, all right, I can stay down this path. People are really responding to this method of engagement. Um, and you only uh, do that when you hear back from people. Um, so we do it as a feedback form, as I mentioned, but you can do it simply as 
oftentimes we've done, we throw up a flip chart at the top of the room and just say, what are some pl pluses from today's meeting? What are some things that worked and what are some deltas or some things that we can improve for next time? And just regularly doing that as a practice um, is really helpful. Uh, Christina saying, thanks. I used to do these and let them go um, and I will bring them back. Yeah, I find it really, really helpful. And it's just one of those things that once you get into the, the rhythm of doing it over and over, it just becomes uh, second nature, especially with the group if you're doing it over and over again as well. Um, the next piece about the elements of a good meeting is really thinking about your roles. Um, and we have some examples here. You're the facilitator, the note taker, the timekeeper, the tech person, if you have uh, online meetings or hybrid meetings, a chat box monitor, again, for online or hybrid. Um, so just some things to really think about. Um, I think the, the takeaway from this slide as we move through is really just setting some time aside to plan, right? You have to be intentional about all of these pieces. Um, once you get the ball rolling and you get really into the routine of it, some of these sort of like just come and you don't really have to think that much about it. Um, but for effective meetings, you really wanna think through and be thoughtful about who is going to be the facilitator, who's gonna be the backup facilitator, who's gonna be doing all these things. So for example, um, our team, Paula and I are co-facilitating today. Co today. Victoria is on tech, but she's also on the background. Sometimes we get some CHTI emails that come in as folks are like, I can't sign into the meeting. I don't know where my registration link is or how do I log in? So she's also doing that on the back end to make sure that we can get as many participants um, as we can for today as well. She's dropping stuff in the chat box as we ask you all questions. She's creating breakout rooms so that Paula and I can focus on the content and the slides and we don't have to put our mind to, um, to some of the other things that happen in the background. Allison as well is providing support um, and is also a very well experienced facilitator. So when Paula and I perhaps come up with something, they're like, oh, I don't know what we're gonna say. Allison, do you have anything to that? So those are the roles and things um, that you can think about as you start to plan and set up for, for effective meetings, like what are some things that you would find really helpful as a facilitator? Um, if you have the folks to do it. Not, we don't all have that luxury. Sometimes you're the one that's doing all the things. So being able to give yourself a little grace in those spaces too, I think is important. Um, and then you all mentioned as you were sharing back from the question that we asked you is that um, making it feel like making meetings feel like you accomplished something. So that's what this kind of bullet point is getting at, this idea of making decisions. Are we making a decision together? Are we working towards a goal? Um, what are things that we're doing so that folks feel like there was their time was valued in this space um, and they were able to give input, being able to have folks feel um, like they're connected and responsible for what's happening in that space. Um, is a really uh, important element for, for a good and effective meeting. Um, and again, building relationships, engaging people, whether it's moving and doing kind of like movement activities if you're in the room um, or creating space for folks to be engaged online as well. And we'll go over what that's gonna look like in the next couple of slides. Um, and then just something for you all to keep in mind that everything, everything takes longer for online and hybrid. Hybrid is my least favorite type of meeting just because it's really complicated, um, but I a lot of people do it and sometimes effectively, sometimes not, but it just depends on what you've got going on. Um, but I would love to hear from you all if you have thoughts, reflections about any of these pieces. Um, and also, are you doing in-person? Are you doing online? Are you doing hybrid? Are you doing all the things? What kind of meetings are you all doing? And you can add it to the chat box or just unmute yourself. Go ahead, Christine. We are doing uh, Zoom meetings particularly, and it's several times a week and throughout the month. It's all the time as a food policy council. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we we have done all these different pieces, but you're for me, the area of decision-making and being in the space is very fascinating and challenging. And same with um, the expectations around building relationships. Mm -hmm. um, since everybody in the space has very different expectations about building relationships. So it's been very challenging. 
Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm not absolutely. sure I answered the question. But. You did, you did, you absolutely did. And and re and thinking through as a facilitator, understand that okay, everybody's coming from a different place and has different expectations of this space. What are ways that we can create room to have the conversation, right? Or to have at least or bring people to that same understanding using things like the group agreements, the pluses and deltas, and then revisiting some of those conversation as you move through your meeting so that you can kind of weave in some of those elements of like all right, this is what we heard from folks, or this is what we all agreed to in our group agreement. So I just want to highlight this for our group as we move forward. Um, and I hear from folks in the chat box as well that they're doing both online and in person, mostly online because meetings are community based. That's one of the things that we've learned since COVID is that sometimes making things online is more accessible for, for folks. Sometimes not, but it just depends on your crew. Uh, mostly virtual, sometimes in person, again, mostly online, but an occasional, both, but more remote, and especially larger meetings tend to be remote. In-person meetings tend to have fewer participants. Absolutely, that's a trend that we've been seeing at the Community Health Training Institute over these last four years as well. It's much easier to get folks in the room online versus in person. You have to have a really good compelling reason or maybe some really good food to get people to come <laughs> in person as well. Um, awesome. So we can move to the next slide. Again, these are similar to what we just talked about. These are approaches to facilitation. We want to think about having goal-oriented meetings, right, that we're problem-solving or making decisions and that we're making all of our agendas as interactive as possible or at least creating different modes that folks can engage with the content that you have going on um, for our for your particular agenda. So the next slide is actually an example of how you can think about having some clear goals because it can be really tough to sort of think through. And so these are just some examples. Um, so are, there are different models for writing problem statements. And then you have examples here that are one that's kind of vague, one that's better, and then one that, that's best. Um, so the first kind of vague example is how can we engage more community members? So that could be a goal, but how can we make that slightly more uh, just like a better goal statement. So the next one that you see here is getting at more like who it, who is it that we're trying to engage? So how we can increase attendance in coalition meetings. All right, so that's getting a little bit better. There's a, a particular thing or, or member that we're trying to get at. Um, and then the last one, which is categorized as best here is how can we increase increase attendance in coalition meetings that is reflective of our community by the next fiscal year. So for me, when I take a look at the one that's best, right, it's being really clear about who it is that we're trying to engage um, and it's giving yourself sort of a time commitment, right? Um, so if you think about SMART goals, it's kind of the same idea. It's specific, it's measurable, it's attainable, it's realistic, and it's time bound. Um, I think I got all the letters. <laughs> in there. So it's one thing to say we want more folks coming to our meetings, um, but it's another thing to say, okay, let's really think through that. Like if we got more of the folks that were coming from the health department to our meetings, is that really getting to our goal? Or do we want community members that are reflective um, of who we're trying to help impact, right? What our, our, our coalition's goal is, right? That's a different story. So let's be really clear about what it is our goal is. Um, and then that'll help increase the success of meeting that goals when we have a full understanding of what it really is. The next slide is talking through some of the things that we've named so far. So content is the what versus the process, like how you're doing these things. Um, so the content of your meetings can be anything from the tasks that you're trying to get done to the subjects for discussion, the problems that need to be solved or the challenges that have come up for your group, the decisions that need to be made, any other agenda items that you that you think are important to add in there. And then of course, the goals and objectives for each meeting. So if you start to think through this and think through your own meetings and agendas that you're putting together, do you have the goals listed on the agenda or are folks coming to the meeting with a clear understanding of the decisions that are still need to be made, right? Or how they're 
how they're going to be involved in that decision making process um, and what the goals and objectives are of that particular meeting as well. Like, is that listed anywhere? Have you talked about it with your group? Have they given input at all? Have you thought through what that could look like for your folks? Um, and then the methods or excuse me, the process or the how that you're doing uh, these conversations can look different depending on what is effective with your group. Um, so you can think through all the different sort of group dynamics that you have going on. Like maybe you have someone that's really, really engaged and is always talking and always sharing. Maybe you have someone that's really, really quiet, right? And so you can use different methods to, to get folks engaged in different ways and to help sort of elicit conversation to help get you to, to all the content that you're trying to move through. Any thoughts or questions about this slide? Or any of these pieces? All right, we can move to the next one. So process tools. These are the things that we use to help get to our end goal. So what we're going to be using today, some of which you, we've already done. So we've done some small group work. You've had some small group conversations and we do that online via breakout rooms. We find that that's probably the most effective. You can also use breakout rooms to do pair work um, as well. So those are two sort of process tools that are really um, effective that we find with groups that are are both formed and newly formed. So with groups that don't know each other, like you all throwing you in a breakout room, having you interact with one another and have conversations is really, really helpful. But also if you have a group that's been meeting regularly and they have relationships, they know one another, sometimes small group conversations or pair conversations are really helpful to then bring folks back into the large group. They've had a chance to kind of mull over their ideas, share with one or a few other people, and then they're more willing and able to share in a large group because they've been able to talk it out a little bit. So I love having small and small group work and pair work as well. Some other things that are on here as well is visioning, having some visioning activities where you're doing a little bit of self-reflection. We've done like guided meditations with folks. We've done art activities where folks kind of really just like draw out what their visions are for their community. Um, that can look a million different ways depending on um, what you've got going on with your group. Um, and then brainstorming, right? whether you're brainstorming in the room, on a piece of paper, where you're brainstorming on a slide or out loud in a conversation, just generating all kinds of ideas um, to help you kind of start the conversation of what it is that you're trying to do with your group. Straw polling is another thing that I believe you can poll both on Zoom and then of course you can definitely poll in person just to get a read on your audience. What are folks feeling? How do we think uh, this next step should be handled or how should this solution be uh, achieved? I think that one of the conversations that if you haven't already had with your group, if you're making decisions um, with your group, one of the things that is really helpful to know is that like, what's your sort of decision-making process? Or is it consensus when you're meeting with your group? Like we all have to agree in order for this solution to be decided upon? Or is it that we're gonna talk about it in this group, but the facilitator is ultimately gonna make the final decision or the director of the program is ultimately gonna make the final decision for folks to understand what they uh, can expect when it comes to decision-making in your group. So all of those elements are really important as well. Um, but yeah, these are just a little overview of some process tools. What have you all used in your meetings? If, and if there's something on here that you, or something that's not on here that you've used, I'd love to hear as well. What do you find that's kind of effective with your groups of folks? I can jump in. Yeah, go um, for it. Something that we do is we have like, when we're, we're operating a food pantry at our, at our group, um, we work at a community health center in Boston mm. and We'll do like consistent check-ins every food pantry day to like just kind of see how things went, what could be better, planning for the day. Um, and so that's kind of more just like kind of chatting and catching up. But then mm -hmm. once a month, we also do an activity that's focused on a goal. And so something that we've done is like brainstorming or like um, like visioning or kind of small group work. And that's a good way to like 
keep it interactive and different, but also be able to have like visuals for what we're Mm. trying to work toward. Absolutely. Then what happens after that? Once you've done an activity like that, what happens with your group or what happens with that information? So our uh, manager kind of like analyzes that Mm. um, and saves it and brings it up for the next monthly meeting where she was like, all right, I noticed in these categories, there were these themes. And so let's start to work on a theme and um, create an activity for it or like um, something like that. So she does take a lot of that work of of being the facilitator for those mm-hmm. meetings. Um, but it's a good way to to kind of analyze what we're doing in a different way other than just talking about it. Absolutely. And it really shows that commitment, right? And and that consistency that we're not just having this conversation for the sake of having a conversation, right? Your thoughts, your feedback, your ideas are going to be incorporated in the next thing, or we heard you, we're going to think about this, and then we're going to make a decision based on what we heard from you all, right? That follow through is really important. Um, to to get at all those things that we've been talking about to to make it feel like I'm engaged, I'm connected. This meeting was effective because I was able to have input to the next thing that's coming for our group. Absolutely. Um, and then we have in the chat box brainstorming verbally using a tool like Jamboard, working together on a shared document and talk through each, each section. Absolutely. And then at Jamboard is sunsetting. Google is kind of getting rid of Jamboard. So Allison is asking, what tools are people switching to? Um, and we have Canva has a great what Canva has a great whiteboard feature. Haven't used it with my current team yet. Um We use Google Slides. Sometimes we'll actually be using Google Slides later today as well. Hopefully they don't get rid of that feature. (laughs) But yeah, if there are other tools or uh, systems that folks are using, please feel free to add it to the chat box as well. Uh, Zoom has a whiteboard feature too, but I don't know that it like keeps it. Like you would have to like take a screenshot if you use the whiteboard for for Zoom, I think, right? Yeah, it's also inconsistent because it's really hard for people who are on their phones and joining Mm -hmm. if that's their option or if they don't have the latest updates. It's just, it's too much trouble for the Zoom whiteboard feature a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Wonderful. Thank you all for that. We'll have to give Canva a try. I actually love Canva for creating all kinds of other stuff. So I bet their their whiteboard feature uh, is something worth exploring as well. Myro is also really good for that. Say that again? Myro boards. Oh, can you add it to the chat box? I don't know. I yeah, I like will. I've heard of that one and probably yeah. have used it. Thank you. All right, so I think we're ready to move to the next slide. Myro, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this pop model is just another sort of tool or framework that you can use for putting together your agendas. It's something that I use pretty regularly whenever I'm putting together the agenda, which POP stands for purpose, outcomes, and process, right? So the purpose is why are we undertaking this? What is the purpose of us getting together and having this meeting? And in a second, I'll show you sort of an example of one that I've put together, but really you're just listing it out. What's the goal of this meeting um, or the overall goal of this group? What is the purpose for us to coming together and undertaking this thing, right? And then the outcomes or sometimes called objectives, either one, um, is what are the specific outcomes that we want to accomplish as a result of this action? So by the end of this meeting, we want to have this, this, and this accomplished, right? So the purpose can be kind of your overall goal. The outcomes are the objectives of that particular meeting. And then the process are the things that you're gonna do to accomplish those outcomes that are then gonna feed into that overall purpose. So if you go to the next slide, I can walk you through what this what this looked like for me. So I know this slide is not that big. Um, so you can adjust your screen if you want to just see the slide and not everyone else's face. I always like to look at people's faces, but. I'm going to not do that for the purpose of this <laughs> so I can walk you through. So this is actually a working group meeting that I did for one of my clients. 
um, that was a youth organization and we were supporting their strategic planning process. And so their strategic planning process was sort of this big thing that they put together and the working group meetings um, were two hour meetings that we had weekly and biweekly just to sort of move towards completing their strategic planning process for their organization. So the purpose of this particular meeting and sort of that's connected to our overall goal was to continue to work on refining and finalizing our values and goal statements. Um, and we were currently in phase two of their strategic planning process. So they had some core values that they wanted to, to, fight, to you know, revisit and we had been working on them. And then they had some core goals for the organization that they wanted to make sure um, got revised as well through the strategic planning process. So that was the purpose, right? That was the thing that was our guiding light. That's what we're working towards. And then the outcomes of that two hour meeting, by the end of that meeting, we wanted to make sure that all the values that we had been working on had solid the drafts that we felt really good about it. And then we wanted to have the goals almost finalized. We were kind of going back and forth on a few of their goals and rewording things kind of over and over again. So we wanted to have them in a better place, right? We wanted to have them finalized. And then we wanted to have a next steps in place for the next working group meeting. And we were really intentional about like every meeting we wanted to sort of like have them picture where they were in that process because it was over a year long process. And that can feel really daunting when you're in the weeds of all the things. So we just wanted to make sure that they knew sort of what that guiding light was and then what was coming next for the next working group meeting. And that really sort of helped set the tone for us as we move through, because we were meeting we weekly and we moved to bi-weekly, but we were meeting weekly pretty consistently for two hours. And that can feel like a lot um, for a strategic planning process when, you know, some of these, uh, People were, you know, doing youth work. It was a youth work organization. So they were doing all kinds of other stuff. And this was just an added thing onto their role. Um, so it was a lot of sort of really intensive work um, as we were moving through. And so the process or the things that we did throughout that meetings, we we started off with check-ins. Uh, we went over the agenda every single meeting. Um, and then we named it, where are we in this sprint? Uh, where are we in our, in our race here to get to the end of the strategic planning process? Um, we went over any updates at the beginning of every meeting before we kind of jumped in and did our work, our value and goal work. Um, we talked, and if there were time, we wanted to go through strategies. These are just different steps of their strategic planning process, but it was really just kind of walking them through. This is the things that we're trying to accomplish. Um, and sometimes we got through a full agenda and sometimes we didn't. And so if we didn't, what are ways that we can readjust so that in our next steps, we're adding that to the conversation. Like we were hoping to get to this, we didn't. So we're going to bring it to the next meeting and just connecting those dots for folks. Um, and then talk through the next steps before we wrapped. I think the, the added sort of benefit that we had for this particular meeting that you might not that you might not have in your meetings is that we were a third party, right? I was working with a client. This was their organization with their staff people. And I was coming in as, as an outside facilitator, just helping walking them through the process versus being someone that's in it with them, right? So you might not have that luxury. You're you're probably not coming in as a third party. You're, these are your coworkers and your colleagues and your community members that you're working with. Um, so that's just another element to put out there. Um, but yeah, I'm curious, have you all used anything like this? Um, or could you see yourself using something like this just to help you kind of move through and build more effective agendas? Any thoughts or reactions about any of these pieces? I can go. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so I've seen my team manager does this at a weekly huddle. So it really does for a like follow, she follows this format. And at the end um, for like the wrap up, there's always like, sometimes if we have a few extra minutes, she'll ask us like anything else we want to add in or bring up less different from our schedules, like share with the team. So yeah, I've definitely seen this format like with all of her team huddles. 
Wonderful. I love that. And this is just one format. It's, it's a one that I particularly enjoy. It's easy for me to kind of plug in. And then when I have ongoing meetings consistently, I can just take the template that I used the week before or the, you know, the months before and replace it with things. And then that way I can, um, make sure that we're tackling things that perhaps we didn't get to the the week before and bringing up the next steps that we had talked about at the close of the last meeting. So that that way I find it really, really helpful. So I encourage you all, if it's not this, um, try to find sort of a system that could make it easier for, for yourself. There's not a link, but we can, uh, we can share sort of like a Word doc template when we send out the slides and everything after this training. Happy to share that with you all. And we will show the slides as well. Wonderful. So we've done sort of talking through meeting elements and different approaches to facilitation and quickly reviewed kind of the tools that you all can use in some of your meetings. Um, we're going to take a quick 10 minute break in a second, but when we come back, we're going to talk more about the facilitator, right? And what things are you can do for yourself to help prep um, for your meetings as well. So if there aren't any other thoughts or questions, we're going to put up a timer and we're going to take a quick 10 minute break break. We're energized, ready to take it on. All right. So now we're going to move on to the next bit of content, which I will be leading, um, which is um, what makes a good facilitator? And we'll start that off with what does a good facilitator look like? So next slide, please. There we go. Okay, so this is going to be a fun activity where I'm going to have y'all think. Okay, so this is a little bit abstract. And we start off with this bit of like this little example, just to get your feet wet. Okay, so the good news is that there's a lot of ways to be a good facilitator and a lot of ways, a lot of ways for a good facilitator to, facilitator to look like. Now, the way that we kind of classify facilitators in this activity is by animals. So kind of like what animal represents you as a facilitator? So that's kind of based off your presence, your style as a facilitator. So for example, someone who's energetic, who's a questioner, they are a lion. Someone who is calm and a silence dweller <laughs> is an owl. And I see Brian here is proud to be a dingo who is fun and humorous, but also a silence breaker. And dingoes are dogs. And if you all have dogs, you know that dogs bark a lot. I know that this little guy behind me, oh, I don't know if you can see him. He's all blurry, but he's behind me right now. And he is a little terrier who barks so much. He is definitely a silence breaker. So um, <laughs> so we have some uh, prototypes there, but I want to say that you can get creative and we're going to give you some more examples of what, um, what presences and styles um, you can be as a facilitator. Um, and you can mix them, up, mix them up around. Like if you feel like you're energetic, but also a silence breaker instead of a questioner, you can still call yourself a lion if you want. You know, it's, it's what you feel represents you. And when it comes to presence, what we mean is what kind of energy you give off as a facilitator. So when I come into the space, I think that I am someone who is energetic and fun. Um, I, I love talking to people. I love interacting with them. So this, it, it makes me feel like I'm in my element. Now, my style, um, I feel like I'm a silence, silence breaker. I don't feel... I often don't feel very comfortable like being in silence. Um, and I think that a lot of people can relate to that. Um, but some silence dwellers feel like they can, like the silence is a space to reflect, is a space to contemplate. And they feel comfortable in that. And they want to give space for other people to raise their hand, have the courage to, to participate as well. So there is space for all of these styles. And um they're all useful um, for facilitation. Now, I think that I am either a lion or a dingo. Um, depends on the day. <laughs> I think right now I feel like a dingo, honestly. Uh, next slide. So these are some more examples of presence and style that um, we have for you. And you can choose from any of these and mix and match and create your own profile. 
So um, we mentioned energetic, someone who's high energy, who's enthusiastic, they're ready to engage. Um, similar to someone who's charismatic, they command attention, they have a captivating presence. Um, people are following along to their every word. Someone who is fun also in incorporates humor, lightness, and playfulness. And someone who's warm, they offer empathy, kindness, and their atmosphere is very, very inviting. Um, on the other hand, we have people who are calm. They, they have a steady, composed, and a soothing presence. So similar to someone who's warm, their environment is very, very welcoming, very inviting, very calm, very soothing. Um, and someone who's neutral, they have a balanced, impartial space. They, they don't dominate the space. They want other people to feel like they're also in control, like they also can take up space. So like in anything, there is no one style that's better than the other. What we feel is that there's a good, a good balance of styles is what makes a really great facilitator. Um, similar to, sorry, balance of presences. Um, and I think the same thing applies to balance of styles, right? We don't, we don't want only one kind of style to be used. But, you know, what is, the question is like, what's the one style that you have in your back pocket that you generally rely on um, or that you see yourself mainly using when you're facilitating, right? So we have questioners, people who use questions um, to break silences, um, silence dwellers, like we said before, silence breakers. We have connectors, people who link ideas and contributions. They help participants see things that weren't there before. So that's really helpful because it brings more food for thought into the space and it allows people to have something to chime in on. They can say, oh, I never thought about it that way. Actually, this reminds me of blank. So it's it's great for people to um, to bring some change up into the space and to, to add more stuff for people to hang on to. Someone who challenges, they hear someone participate and they say, wow, that was a great thought. Can you tell us what you mean by this? Or can you elaborate on that? And that allows us to really understand what that person is trying to say and connect with them better in the space. Someone who's an encourager, they, they're people who often see, okay, Gina hasn't really been participating much. And I think that um, we want to give her a chance to, to make a contribution because she might just be shy. And we can say, okay, everyone, let's have space for other people who haven't spoken before to come into the space, or let's all like say in the chat what we what what um an answer to this, you know. That way, you know, it, it encourages people to participate without necessarily cold calling, but it does provide like open up the space for people who aren't usually comfortable doing so, um, or aren't usually comfortable making space. Then we have synthesizers, which is so important. Um, a synthesizer is someone who takes everything that people have said and put, like wraps it up in a little bow, summarizes everything, and highlights the key points and insights that have been said so far. It's great because it also provides food for thought. It lets people um, take in all this information and digest it properly. Um, organizers, they keep the session structured. They are time management. They ensure that their goals and timelines are met for the meeting. And lastly, storytellers. They love to talk. They use narratives and they use personal experience and anecdotes to really get the point across and make sure that people are understanding the point, um, the main message of the meeting. So next slide, please. So we have some animals here for you. Um, we have the lion who takes command of the space. We have the owl who sits and listens and, and watches um, and observes. We have the dingo who is fun and um, energetic, similar to the monkey who is playful and wants to ask questions um, and gets curious. The tortoise who um, takes in everything and regurgitates wisdom, essentially. Um, the spider who makes connections. The parrot who storytells and, and provides their own personal experience. So 
we have a lot of information there that we just provided you. And now I'm just going to give you a few minutes and we're going to think about what animal you are and what your presence and story and um, style mainly looks like. Again, people can have multiple presences depending on the situation, depending on um, your mood for the day. You can, all, you can have different styles depending on what's needed. But we're asking you, what is your main presence? What is your main style? And how does that move into animals? How does that uh, show as an animal? And yes, we'll go back one screen to see the options. Okay, so let's just do like three minutes and put on some music in the meantime. Uh, so Christine is saying, this is tough. It's perception too. Organizer, energetic, warm, charismatic, maybe a shepherd dog. Yes, absolutely. You can, you know, it's up to you what, what kind of dog that you'd like, what kind of animal you'd like to be. Um, even if it's a specific dog breed, absolutely. Um, so Christine just shared hers. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else want to come off, uh, off mute and share their animal, their presence or style? Um, owl still speaks to me. I'm like the sort of calm presence, but also, um, being observant and sort of quiet. I, and then also with that observation, being able to like, um, synthesize and summarize as the meeting sort of goes along and um, be responsive to like group agreements or decisions like as you go. I've been in meeting with, meetings with you, Allison. I would agree. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? I I tend to think that I kind of fluctuate between charismatic and fun when it comes to presence. Um, and same with uh, silence breaker and synthesizer. I'd say those kind of go hand in hand in a way, break the silence to summarize a little bit. Absolutely. And I see that you're a dingo. Oh yes, I am a dingo. <laughs> Much like the <laughs> shepherd talk. I have a shepherd and she has a lot of attitude and likes to talk a lot, so yeah. So there we go, <laughs> silence breakers for sure. Anyone else? You can also um, share the chat. Oh, go for it. Yeah, sorry. I, I know in the chat I put down that I feel like I fit into too many boxes, so I chose lion and uh, uh, parrot. But I was just going to say I'm also biased. I have a border collie, and I see that they're fantastic in getting you, uh, bring, bringing you along. Uh, they have an agenda. They have. They want you to do something, and they are so good at sort of getting you to follow them and do what they want you to do. Um, so, sort of, not necessarily in a way that you know you want people to just follow you blindly, but at the same time, sort of get getting you, um, getting them to buy into the ideas that you're probably trying to get accomplished. Um, so I'd say I'm part border collie too. My parent and a border collie. <laughs> oh, you have quite a chimera going on. Thank you. <laughs> um, and honestly, I think for next time we should uh, add a border collie or um, a shepherd to our to our pictures as well because they seem to be coming up a lot. And I I completely agree. Those are great animals to to use for facilitation. All right. Well, That's thank you all for sharing. Oh. Go ahead. Sorry. I will share mine. I will, I mean, I came in very late because I, I just jump off under the meeting. So I'll share mine. Um, I miss a lot of the meeting, but that's fine. Since I'm on this page, I will share. I think I'm like a lion, I think. Um, fun, uh, and energetic in meetings. And I like to connect people, you know. So I'm a connector. Um, I like to be organized. So I like to organization and I like to use stories, you know, to narrate in meetings and stuff like that. So I'm like encompasses all of this stuff. Together. I love that. And thank you for sharing, Miriam. Even though like you missed part of it, I so appreciate you jumping in and, and just participating. Um, that's awesome. I think that we're all a bit of a chimera, just a mix of all these different animals. Um, bit harder to draw, I will say, but 
Great. So thank you all for participating on that. Um, we're going to scoot okay, over gonna... to Paula really quickly. I was just going to say one thing that's really helpful about doing this activity. One, it's fun to kind of think about, but two, it's also really helpful for you to just think about how you show up as a facilitator and what you bring with you and how this conversation or this sort of like idea of you thinking about who, what your style is um, or what your strengths are to have that conversation with your co-facilitator, right? Like this is what I am able to bring. And so how are you showing up and how can we sort of play to our strengths as we move through meetings, particularly ones that tend to be a little bit tougher if you have some challenges coming up with your group, uh, coming up for your group, ways that you can kind of help navigate some of that with you with as a facilitator and with your co-facilitator um, as well. And if there are participants, in your meetings that tend to sort of do some of these things naturally, what are ways that you can sort of draw on that within within the meeting as a facilitator as well and allow to, space for that to happen too, which is nice. Thank you so much for adding that, Gina. And just to add on to that, I think that we can all agree that when we have co-facilitators, it's great to have them be balanced. Um, you know, one of them is the silence breaker. One of them is a silence dweller and they all work off well, where they work well off each other in order to create a really great facilitator group. All right. Any last comments? Okay. So we're going to brainstorm off of what we just, um, the characteristics that we saw that make up a good facilitator, we saw that there's so many. Now we're going to take those and brainstorm uh, even more about, next slide, please. Again, what makes a good facilitator to you? So you can take inspiration from what we talked about before, but you can also like bring in stuff that you talked about in your breakout rooms, in your own per from your own personal experience. And we're gonna note take on the slide here so um, you can say it in the chat, we'll call it out for you, um, or you can just unmute and um, speak up to what you think makes a good facilitator. I'll jump in. Um, I It's funny because it's the opposite style of what I think I am, but I really enjoy facilitators that have kind of more that lion or dingo energy of, um, being kind of fun and light and being engaging. Someone who has a fun energy, who's a lion or dingo, that's their vibe, right? Yeah, or especially like for virtual meetings, it's just helpful to have, kind of like keep the participants engaged. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that's completely, completely true. Um, I think for virtual meetings, we all come on and it's hard for us to stay stay energetic stay in it and it's great for someone to just call us call us in and and get us rolling um brian over here in the comments said someone that doesn't steamroll the whole meeting someone who makes space someone who can hold opposing viewpoints and support the group through disagreement so a mediator kind of thank you rebecca Aaliyah said, someone who is organized and keep things keeps things running on track. Catherine says, someone who recaps the meeting and sets a clear agenda for next steps. I think that that is one of the most important aspects of a productive meeting, having clear next steps um, that are synthesized from what the what was talked about in the meeting because I feel like when I when we don't have a meeting that summarizes the next steps I come away from it feeling like okay what am I supposed to do what is my goal what was that meeting for so I think that that's a very important part um correct me if I'm saying your name wrong Juan um says respects someone who respects our time so they are not going over or starting late so again time management Anyone else want to go off mute and, and give a suggestion? I think uh, I will probably say that uh, someone who, in a break the silence in the meeting, a person who can 
get the meeting into focus because sometimes there's a lot of distractions. And so a person who can make the meeting stay focused, like, you know, like get it going, um, icebreaker, you know, stay focused, put the team together. And I like the fact that you can recap that I like that good one. Definitely. So someone who synthesizes and recaps and energizes their audience. Which is kind of what um, Sarah said at the beginning, someone who has fun energy, especially for virtual meetings. Anyone else have something to add? So what we're going to do at the after this training is we're going to send you all the PowerPoint. Um, and that way you have all this information for when you are planning your next meeting to facilitate. And you have all this, um, all these, this great list at hand. Anything else before I move on? This is a great list. And I think that it well summarizes everything that we talked about. So thank you. All right. Um, so now we're moving on to the facilitators toolbox. So when we have a good facilitator, someone who has the, the characteristics and qualities that we just wrote down, that we just listed, um, there might be times when they still have um, trouble keeping the audience engaged, especially in a virtual and a hybrid setting. Um, hybrids are very daunting, I think, for most of us. Um, so they have, you know, their little toolbox that they bring in, they can open up and pull out some um, some handy dandy and classic tools. And these are things that we've already talked about. So to keep an audience engaged when we see that there's um, a gap or a break in silence, um, we can ask some questions, see um, if anyone has any any concerns, anything that they don't understand, or if um, there's anything else that they're curious about. Or you can take from the material and you can say, well, given what we've discussed, if A plus B equals C, then what is Z, you know? Um, there's also silence. You can use silence as a great tool for contemplation and reflection, as we've talked about before. Um, I know a lot of people who are really good at keeping the silence and not breaking it until someone else speaks up. That is not me, um, but, but it is a great tool for some people. Um, the last one is food for thought. So that's kind of what we've been talking about when it comes to putting something new into the conversation that is a synthesis of what's been discussed already. Um, a connection, connecting the dots to create um, a different perspective of something or or just um, some like a, sorry, had a brain fart. Um, a connection, a synthesis, um, a new question, anything that allows people to start thinking again, to a lot of the times people aren't participating because they just feel stuck. They don't feel like they have something new to say, so they don't say anything. And that's perfectly respectable. Um, but if you provide them with something, with a new idea, then it might churn up the pool a little bit. And if all of that fails, then you also have your process tools again, which are on the next slide. So let's look at them again. We have visioning, brainstorming, straw pulling, small group work, individual work, and pair work. So like half of these, you know, the pair work, individual work, small group work, I think are big spaces for us to contemplate, to reflect. And the pair work and small group work are ways for us to bounce, you know, the audience and the, the people in your meeting to bounce ideas off each other, to kind of refresh the stagnation in the room. And, um, get people to t start talking again even if it's amongst like each other where they might feel more comfortable talking um 
I love straw polling. I think it's great. I love little polls when I go to meetings because it just wakes me up a little bit. Um, gets me thinking again. Um, visioning allows us to, again, refresh the information, allow us to see them from a different perspective. And so you have these, um, these tools in your back pocket in case none of the other None of the other um, tools seem to be effective at the moment. Does anyone have any questions or any comments? All right, so let's move on to our packing list. So this is a set of, or a list of, like a checklist for you to kind of just have in your, other back pocket um, when you're preparing for a meeting as well as like during the meeting and in the scenario of all the different kinds of meetings you can have. So feel free to pepper in into the chat if you have any other um, things for the packing list, but we are going to discuss it a bit later as well. So first is general preparation, which applies to all meeting formats, whether that's in-person, hybrid, or virtual. So first is meeting planning and objectives. This is the idea creation. This is the the real like content planning of it all. So what are the goals for this meeting? From that, we create the agenda. Is the agenda ready to send out? Are you setting up the meeting in person, virtual, hybrid? You have to determine that as well. Do you know how many people are attending versus how many people are, have RSVP'd? Um, out of that list, like how many do you actually think are going to come? Because especially with, when it comes to virtual meetings, um, for, me for meetings that are free, especially, I would say there is a big drop off when it comes to registration versus people who attend. Um, it's very low commitment. You don't have to prepare to drive anywhere. Ironically enough, even though it's harder to get somewhere in person, um, once you've made that mental commitment to attend, I think that people do end up showing up in that ratio of RSVP to attendees um, is often less than, or like smaller than the one for virtual meetings because it's so easy to click a button and register and say, oh yeah, if I if I have time for it, I'll go. Um, especially if you don't have to pay anything for it. So that is all something to expect when it comes to preparing for a meeting. So if you have a meeting where you want 50 people to show up, then you need maybe 100 people to register or 120. It depends on what your um, previous registration numbers have been at. So if your ratio for your previous um, webinars, for example, has been two to one, two being the number of um, registrants versus the one is the number of people who actually show up, then you do need 100, reg 100 registrants for 50 people to show up, right? So that's all things to think about, as well as what are your plans B and C? What are your backups in case something, something happens, especially when it comes to virtual uh, meetings? You know, if someone's Wi-Fi um, drops out like it just did for Victoria's, then like we have someone else, you know, who has the slides on deck ready to take up the mantle of sharing. So these are all things to think about when it comes to content planning. The next uh, slide, please. So the next step is coordination and communication. Once you have the agenda, once you have the content planned, now you need to determine how you're going to communicate with your co-facilitator. Is it, are they a coworker? Can you just communicate with them through Teams or Slack? Or are they someone within, from an external organization? Do you need to email them? Do you need to give them your phone number? Um, how often are you meeting with them? What is your uh, meeting schedule look like? So on this week, we're going to do a general brainstorm of what this training will be about. On this week, we'll come back with our own respective slides for this training. On this week, maybe the day before the training or something, we'll do a run through together. Um, and you'll exercise constant communication throughout in case anything else comes up. Again, the run through is right there. Um, you want to familiarize yourself with your audience. So 
for example, for this meeting, we, uh, Gina specified before that this uh, meeting is for people who are not, um, it, it's mainly focused for people who are not already incredibly experienced with meeting facilitation. This is for newcomers, people who would love some more experience. And that is who we geared this presentation toward in our content. Um, we had a training earlier in the year called Dynamic Meeting Facilitation, which Gina also ran. And that was more focused for people who were um, at a more advanced stage of meeting facilitation. So we coordinated the content and um, yeah, we coordinated the content to that uh, degree. Um, you also want to assign support roles, which Gina talked about earlier as well. So we have Victoria um, running tech. We have um, someone else being note taker. Um, who's who's pressing record if we're recording the meeting? Um, do we have co-facilitators? Uh, is there someone who's monitoring the chat, who's sending information in the chat, links, and other like discussion questions? So that's all important to nail down before you start the meeting so that everything can run as smoothly as possible. Now we have logistics and accessibility. Do you need um, ASL or language translation for this meeting? So we wanna make sure that everyone can understand and can be understood for um, any meeting that we're in. So a lot of the times when you especially when you're doing like an external meeting, you wanna be able to ask in your registration, um, your registration form, do you have any accessibility needs that we would, um, that you would like us to accommodate for? Um, a lot of the, for example, for other projects that I've been in, when it comes to community engagement, we have had um, multiple language translators for Haitian Creole, um, Spanish, Simplified Chinese, um, come and, and and be in their own separate channels and um, talk during the webinars as well um, to translate for our many, our diverse audience. Um, you also want to prep and send an email with instructions for the meeting, anything like, for example, if it's an in-person meeting, you wanna do parking, like where can you park in this, in this area? Or um, we're actually gonna do some pre-reading. So make sure that you take a look at this, um, at this article and make sure that the article is actually accessible to people because some of them are just behind paywalls. Um, if you have a PowerPoint that you'd like to share beforehand, if you have an agenda that you'd like to share beforehand, all of that is great to, um, it's great to prep your audience as much as possible so that they know that you're going to this full force. And that's something that we've institu instituted recently with CHGI in the last couple of years, just when we recognize that it's easier for accessibility to send the slides before the training so that folks can look through if there's any information that they can't really read or see, they can follow up with us. And then in all of our registrations for any of the trainings that we have, um, there are requests that folks can make. We've had requests for ASL. Um, we have not had requests for other languages, but that space is available if we did have someone that was interested in, in having that. We've had requests for closed captioning. So there are spaces that we've sort of instituted recently so that we can make sure that we're trying as much as we can to be accessible for folks and the needs that they come with. Thank you, Gina. Um, and I think I just want to add that I didn't, that I missed here for coordination and communication, um, create the registration form. That's just an additional one. All right, next one. Uh, continuing with uh, Gen Prep, we have um, what technology do you need? So, um, what virtual meeting platform are you using? Are you using Zoom, WebEx? Um, WebEx is really confusing, by the way. What a weird user interface. I prefer Zoom or or Teams even, honestly. Um, so you have to factor that in into the situation as well. Like, what are people going to be able to use most easily, especially if they're new to the platform? Um, what is more, more familiar to people as well? Um, microphone, is, is your, do you need like a... In my microphone here, like, you know, the, the headsets, um, if, is your microphone working? Is your webcam working? Do you need a webcam? Um, 
If you have any interactive tools, let's set those up. For example, Zoom has polls, but you have to set those up before the meeting. Um, you can't just do it while you're in the meeting. So get getting those prepared as well. Um, if you're not using Zoom to record um, or you're at an in-person meeting, what software are you using to record the meeting? I know that some spaces use OWLs. Um, I don't know if you have seen those. They're little cute little thingies and they do a 360 pano of the room and they record the entire meeting. It's really great, honestly. Um, Ale Allison just said, just ran into the webcam issue when I got a new monitor and it didn't have a webcam. That is, I feel like that's pretty common for monitors. For laptops, that's crazy. Um, but yeah, no, um, that is definitely something to think about. Like imagine you're getting the monitor the day before you're hosting a training and you realize it doesn't have a, a webcam. So then you have to go get one immediately. Like these are all really, yeah, these are great things to think about. Um, when you're planning everything, you wanna make sure you've covered all your bases. Even though they seem so obvious, sometimes they're not. Um, you also wanna do a tech run through to make sure that all of your um, software is working properly. Um, you're properly logged in. You have access to all of the tools that you'll be using. If you're using a Padlet, for example, Padlet is a website that allows people to submit um, like cards, answers, um, so we can all visualize and see everyone's information. Do you have a Padlet account? Do you, um, are you logged in properly? Do you have the version that lets you make as many Padlets as you want? Because I ran into that issue where I was going to create a Padlet for a meeting and I ran out of Padlet spaces. So I had to quickly log into someone else's Padlet and use theirs. So that's also something, that's all things that you wanna think about. Next, please. And Gina, if anyone's ever worked with uh, anyone that's employed by the feds, so we have like a youth program that we do trainings for sometimes, and they work at the 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 youth, young people like intern at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Um, and I was doing a virtual training with them, and we were talking about interviewing skills, maybe. And I was like, okay, I'm going to send you all Google slide. We're going to do kind of a brainstorm or add something to the slide together. And they were like, we can't access Google at all whatsoever. There's like firewalls and all the things. And the feds are like, Google is not a thing that we use. So I was like, ah. So in the moment, I sort of had to redirect um, my sort of the way that we did that activity and ended up being fine. But yeah, just being able to sort of be aware of all of the things um, and having access to some things. And then, you know, when all else fails, just like being able to think on your feet a little bit as a facilitator. And for me, I've been facilitating for over 18 years now. Um, even for me, when things like that come up, it takes like I have to get my brain in that space to kind of think through, OK, give me a minute <laughs> and then let me reorient and, and think through what are ways that we can do this a little bit differently. So this is just asking yourselves the questions, right, of what do I need to do to make sure I'm ready to to lead whatever it is that I'm leading. So, yeah, I love these. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I think that also just goes back to knowing your audience, like if you are working with the feds, you want to make sure everything is as accessible and compliant as possible. Um, yeah, uh, I going back to things that you would think are obvious, but sometimes aren't. I just moved recently and I forgot that I had to take away my, like take out my curtain rods. They're just such a part of the space that they they just blend into the walls, you know, at a certain point. But I, I, the day that I moved out, I still had my curtains and curtain rods still on there. So, you know, sometimes you do really need to think outside the box and step away for a sec to see what you need. All right. So moving on. We move on to in-person slash hybrid meetings and how to prep for them as well. So do you need to visit the venue ahead of time? Do you need to arrange seating for inclusivity and visibility? So for example, um, for people who are in wheelchairs, like do you need spaces to create spaces um, for them to sit at the table properly? Are there ramps? Um, is the, if there's a projector, like is it big enough for everyone to see? Are people cl seated close enough to see the projector? Um, are there visual aids? Um, for people to really be engaged and in-person activities. 
are those um, at all prepared? I think that someone mentioned before kinetic activities, and I love those. They're a great way of staying engaged and keeping the audience energized, I would say. So having developing in-person activities that have people move from one side of the room to the other if they agree with something um, or if they disagree. Um, or I think that in an upcoming meeting that we are hosting it for another, another project, we have people creating flower pots and painting their flowers with different ideas to create a central, a central image and, and potting them. It's really sweet. It's, it's, it's going to be really fun. So yeah, just being able to keep people having fun, um, because it's already a meeting for work. You have to go there. Um, it's always nice to get people to ha have a smile on their face when they can. Um, and for all of those activities, you do want to prepare supplies. So obviously, you know, if you're having the flower pot activity, you want the pots, you want paper, you want scissors, but you also want the general uh, information like your agendas, um, any other documents, pens, name tags, uh, food. Do you have food prepared? Um, water, any of that that you, you want to make sure people have for the meeting ahead. Coffee's a big one, too, I would say. Uh, next one, please. Bathrooms. Yes, signs to the bathroom, please. Sometimes they're so hard to find in, in some spaces. Um, hybrid and virtual meetings for those. So I, I'm considering them. Oh, sorry. We have hybrid meetings and hybrid virtual meetings. So the way that I've organized it is hybrid slash in-person, hybrid alone, and hybrid virtual meetings. So we move on to the hybrid meeting, which is like if you are providing food, crafts, or other hands-on elements in person, how will you accommodate those if you also have online participants? Are you going to be mailing things, mailing materials to them beforehand? Um, are you going to be creating things with stuff that might everyone might have at home like hopefully paper you know um or make sure that the cameras and microphones are positioned so that all in personal in-person attendees are like in in camera and visible and audible um you know that's again where the owl might come in i have been in meetings before where um the owl has made again this is or any kind of software. It doesn't have to be the owl. I'm just using it as an example because that's what I know. Um, it allows us all to see each other so that the space can be more engaging. Um, for meetings that are hybrid and virtual, do you need closed captioning for this meeting? Uh, again, like, do you need translation services? What platforms might the visual, the, the virtual folks be using? And how well do those platforms integrate with in-person meetings? How can we prepare them to integrate with these in-person meetings? So all of that, I would say, you want to think about when um, preparing for meetings that are hybrid or virtual. And next slide, please. So there's definitely a lot more to um, that you can think of that is, is very personal to each person's situation. Um, but those are some general ideas that you wanna think about when preparing for any type of meeting. Um, but the key takeaway here is that you, a dynamic facilitator, a flexible facilitator is a prepared one. You wanna be able to have your plan B and C in your back pocket so that you can be flexible enough to switch over and um, do it in a, in a competent way, I would say. Um, it's, a, it's important to spend a good amount of time before your meeting to get to know your co-facilitator, to understand each other, to assign roles to other people on your team, and to set expectations for what your participants can expect in the meeting. Um, but again, as long as you keep up a good attitude, you're flexible, you're rolling with the punches, and you're staying on time, I would say that that um, all constitutes and contributes to a good meeting. Um, before we move on, I want to um, just ask if anyone has anything else that is in their packing list for any kind of meeting, whether it be any, a general meeting, virtual, hybrid, or in-person. 
having refreshments or little doodads or something like that is always good. Like a physical takeaway or something to consume. Do you by doodads? Do you mean um like fidget spinners or little um? I was just about to hold up. Yeah, doodads. I love that. <laughs> I've had those for meetings as well, and they honestly really do help you concentrate. You can just do that while you're listening. It's great, especially when things can get a little overstimulating. Thanks, Brian. Anyone else? You can also mention in the chat. All right. Well, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Gina so she can finish it off with the last section. Thank you. So we're going to give you also, we've been talking about effective meetings, different meeting elements, and then all the things that you should have or could have in your back pocket as a facilitator. So now we're going to give you an opportunity to put some of those tools and skills to use. So in a second, we're going to do some breakout rooms and we're going to have you just talk through some of these scenarios. So we'll have three breakout rooms and we have three scenarios. So group one is going to talk through scenario one, group two is going to talk to scenario two and group three will talk through scenario three. Um, so we will drop these uh, scenarios in the chat box as well. So you can revisit while you're in your groups. But scenario one is about uh, a new coalition member is set to join today. Uh, for today's meeting, you'll split into working groups for an event that you're planning, right? So most of the legwork has been done. Your existing coalition members have been involved. Um, what are you going to do to help this new member feel included? How can other coalition members support? So as a facilitator, what are you going to do to help this new coalition member feel supported? And what are other roles that folks in your group can hold? So I want you all to talk through that, how you might approach that issue um, as a facilitator, and what are some things that you might use, tools, activities, uh, processing tools, things like that. For scenario two is a participant, a participant, excuse me, keeps taking over everyone and is the first to speak every time you ask for input from the group. How do you handle this as a facilitator? What can you say or do to make sure more voices are being heard? So that's scenario two. And then the last one, scenario three, your co-facilitator is running late and they're supposed to start with the opening activity. You haven't prepped for their part of the agenda and aren't familiar with the activity at all. So how do you handle this? Is there anything you can do in prep to help prevent this from happening again? So those are the three scenarios. And in a second, we'll split you up into three groups. Does anybody have any questions about any of this? So you're just talking through what the scenarios are and how you might handle them. And I just drop them into the chat box, scenario one, two, and three. So yeah, when you're ready, Victoria, feel free to split people off into their groups. And we'll give you a few minutes. And when you come back to the large group, we'll share what you all came up with. So let's talk through these scenarios. Why don't we start with scenario one in group one. You had a new coalition member coming and you were planning an event and most of the work is pretty much done. So what did you all talk about? What came up? How might you approach this situation as a facilitator? So we agreed that depending on group size, we can either if it's like a virtual meeting or in person, we can say a few things about the new person and then um, see where they're comfortable contributing since most of the work has already been done and include them in that group um, and have them get comfortable with those group members. Um, we agreed that in larger meetings, when everybody goes around to introduce themselves, it can eat up a lot of the meeting. Uh, and so, if it's virtual, everyone can introduce themselves in the chat so the new person can get a feel and then other people in the group can get a reintroduction if they've forgotten who someone in the group is. But for smaller groups, it's okay to introduce like everybody one by one. We kind of came up with this threshold of a group of 10 and under, it's okay to go one by one. Um, but then having that person kind of get in where they fit in if, for, if we have an event that's kind of pressing and most of the work has already been done. And anybody can feel free to add who was in my group. 
Anything else the groups want to add or anything that came up in your conversation you think is important to worth mentioning? That was great, Aaliyah. Thank you so much for, for that synopsis and for being our team leader. Um, just one quick thing to add. We had also chatted about how the facilitator might take the time either before the meeting or after the meeting to touch base with the new person, um, to to prep the new person or to before the meeting or to answer any questions and bring that person up to speed after the meeting if time doesn't allow before the meeting. Absolutely. I think part of where this scenario comes from is something that I had dealt with actually <laughs> when I was uh, first starting in this space with CHTI. I, had, I think it was like right before COVID. I had moved to a new area of Massachusetts and I wanted to be a part of a coalition in my area on something that I was interested in. And um, it was a well-established coalition. People had been there forever and they kind of knew what their roles were. And I came in as kind of the newcomer. And it wasn't until halfway through the meeting that the facilitator of the coalition meeting was like, oh, by the way, Gina is one of our new members and gave me an opportunity to introduce myself. Um, so there was this sort of weird in-between time. It was fine. It ended up working out. But yeah, being able to take a look at sort of what your coalition already does, paying attention to time, the format and the platform that you're meeting with, how many people. And yeah, absolutely. If there would have been um, a little bit more intention or thought put and like pulled, you know, maybe they pulled me aside and said, hey, we're going to, this is what's happening in this meeting, or this is where you can kind of plug in. That would have been really, really helpful and would have made me feel a little bit more at ease, I think, than the sort of this like awkward halfway introduction that happened in between the meeting. So I love that you all sort of name some of those things that we've been talking about through today's meeting. So thank you so much. Let's go to uh, group two. You talked about the participant that talks over everybody and wants to share all the time. How would you all approach that scenario as a facilitator? I think group two is our smallest group. <laughs> yeah, I can jump in. Sure. Uh, so one thing that um, we talked about is um, maybe having like an activity kind of like an icebreaker activity in your back pocket, like one or two of them as a way to maybe like kill some time if they're the person's just going to be like a minute or two or a couple minutes late. Um, yeah, so just finding ways to like, oh, everyone, you know, turn to the person next to them and introduce yourself and, you know, talk about what brought you here um, to the meeting or something. If that's like an in-person one or um, something like that, just to kill time. Um and another thing that we talked about was like um, maybe like not starting the meeting with something so like critical where you wouldn't, if it was missed, you wouldn't be able to like jump into your like main content. Awesome. So it sounds like you all talked about scenario three where the uh, co-facilitator is running late, maybe? <laughs> we talked about um, scenario two as well. Oh, okay. Oh, that's so you that's right. I'm so sorry. I was completely, we, <laughs> had, we went through number two and then we like bounced around for fun at the other scenarios. Oh, okay, I'm good. So sorry. I'm glad. <laughs> no, you're totally fine. <laughs> uh, I'll let Hermie talk about scenario two. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Yeah, for scenario two, we were basically saying that we can have ground rules before the meeting, hmm. um, you know, make space, take space. You know, we want everybody to participate and um, you know, not to hurt anybody's feelings if we're already into the meetings and we forgot to mention them, those ground rules, maybe we can let them say what they want to say. But, um, you know, when we present the next issue, uh, perhaps before uh, we open up, um, you know, for everybody to comment or speak, we can just say, okay, can we hear from some of you who have been quiet throughout this time? And no, we want to be, you know, we want to get the group's opinion. So um, I, I've been in meetings like that where, you know, it's really hard. You don't want to hurt anybody's feelings and they probably know that they're, <laughs> uh, you're talking about them, but at the same time, if they go on and on, sometimes there's not enough time for anybody else to speak, so. Absolutely, and I love that redirection of like, are there other folks that want to talk and making sure that you're, 
um, referring back to those group agreements or the container that you set up with your group beforehand. Um, one thing that I found really helpful that I've instituted, especially with larger groups of people, is to establish what uh, we just call a speaking order. So like if there's like a topic area or you're brainstorming and then you're sort of talking about all the things that you've brainstormed, um, just like if you want to speak, raise your hand and then you start writing down like, okay, uh, Paula is going to share something, then Victoria and then Aaliyah, right? And then you'll go through the speaking order. If somebody sort of jumps in, be like, all right, hold that thought. I'll put you on the speaking order. But first we're going to hear from this person, this person, this person. And as a facilitator, putting yourself on the speaking order is important too. I do this all the time. I'm guilty of like jumping in the conversation as a facilitator um, to share my own thoughts, but being able to recognize that because you're in front of the room, that comes with a little bit of power. So being able to um, allow yourself uh, to be put into a speaking order with everybody else so that you can sh show that like, you know, this is the process that we're going to be doing in order to, to have folks um, share and and take some space in this room could be could be helpful especially if you have um, a larger group as well and the more that you do it just with anything in facilitating facilitation the more that you do something the more that you practice the words out loud and how you might approach that situation the better that you get at it over time Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and so Sarah started us off talking about scenario three already. So what would you do if your facilitator, co-facilitator is running late um, and you're not prepped for their part of the agenda and activity that you just don't know how to do? What would you do? So one, you can stall, <laughs> right? You can create some time in the beginning um, and so that you can allow for your co-facilitator co-facilitators to show up. Maybe you're doing an icebreaker. Maybe you're doing a round of introductions, um, creating some space in the beginning. But what else? What else came up in conversation for group three? Um, so Brian brought up a good point was okay to be completely honest with your group or your team. Like the reason why your co-facilitator mm -hmm. is running late, like if it's reasonable, like they're in traffic, but if it's like something personal, no need to share that to say that they can't be there. Mm -hmm. And then like you said, um, start out with a, another activity then to fill the time, like an icebreaker, or you can just leave it as that and move on to your section. Mm -hmm. And that way you have enough time in the end, like if your co-facilitator co like does pop in, or if you have the extra time, it leaves room for like questions that a group may have. So, but yeah. Brian brought up a good point, like being honest with your group or your team, like why the other person's not there. And another part is that as a facilitator, we felt like you should have been prepared, <laughs> like review the activities. So if anything happens, like you can take over as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I love all of those suggestions, right? So being honest with your group, we're all human, like things happen. We understand that, that folks get sick and traffic happens and there are other things. So if, yeah, if your co-facilitator is running, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes late, being honest with your group and say, yeah, we're going to start with this instead um, while we wait for so-and-so to arrive. Or we're going to move the agenda around to, to accommodate that schedule and we'll start with this activity um, and then do this planned activity towards the end um, when that person is there or not at all, right? So if first, let's say your co-facilitator isn't able to make the meeting at all, right? This is something we're going to actually move to the next, to the next meeting schedule because um, the, you know, the person who's running this activity is not going to be able to make it. Um, but yeah, always sort of making sure that we're paying attention to all those considerations that Paula went before this, Paula went over before this section, right? What's our plan A, B, and C so that we are prepared should something come up? Um, and not even just in regards to the co-facilitator, in regards to tech, in regards to meeting space so that we have sort of options should something come up with any of those pieces um, that we put together as well. Any other thoughts or recommendations as you all think through any of these scenarios? Um, anything you might suggest as facilitators for us when we're dealing with these types of challenges? Are there any tools or tips that you find really, really helpful? I really I just, liked, oh, you can go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I, 
I just have a question for scenario two. Like, if somebody's being really disruptive, is it when is it okay to privately message them? Like, mm. hey, can you just not talk for a while? <laughs> I think that part is really reflective on uh like how well you know your group like is it someone that you have a relationship with do you know them um or you know that will impact how you sort of kind of pull them aside um I think for me I try as as much as I can to do general redirections like all right is there anyone else that um wants to share thank you so much so and so for sharing I would love to hear from folks that I haven't heard from today um, but yeah, that if it's like a consistent problem and it's somebody that, you know, I would definitely sort of think through how I might pull them aside and say, Hey, I love that you're so eager to share all of your thoughts. Um, and we're, we're happy to sort of, you know, hear, hear what you have to say. And if there's, um, a time before or after the meeting and you have my full attention, I would love to, to offer that to you, um, so that it allows for space for others to share during the meeting. Um, so I think there are definitely different ways that you can um, handle that situation. But yeah, does anybody have any other thoughts or have experience type, you know, uh, working with somebody who's just really eager to to share in in those meetings? Other ways that you've addressed something like that? Mine was also about scenario number two. Hmm. I, uh, especially because I'm quieter. So when people don't leave space, I'm not going to cut anybody off. Hmm. Um but I really liked someone said something about setting ground rules and then like reintroducing those rules throughout the meeting. I find that if I'm in a meeting with people who um, are very eager, if the ground rules are introduced, there's kind of some more space for the quieter people to take. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we do a lot of times with like group agreements or ground rules is that we'll go over it at the beginning of the meeting, right? These are what we've agreed to, especially if it's a meeting or a group that you're meeting with over and over again. Um, just like a reminder, these are our group agreements and this is what our, we holding, we're holding ourselves to throughout this time together. And then at the end of the meeting, you go back, right? What are some things that we did really well in our group agreements? What are some things that we can work on for next time? And that's an opportunity for you to say, oh, I didn't hear from everybody today. Um, or I only heard from a select few voices. I hope next time we can all practice taking more space um in our meeting and so those are ways that you can sort of institute some of those practices as well because the more that, that it becomes part of the routine um the easier it is for your group to kind of fall in line being like oh yeah i'm expected to to share my thoughts and ideas um even if i tend to be a little bit quieter so what are ways that we can take space um together and i often find i really do lean on small group work or pair work when I find when I have that one person that's kind of just talking 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 I'm like I'm gonna put you all in small groups <laughs> I want you all to share in small groups and then when we come back I want to hear from each group so it sort of creates the structure for 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 hearing from everyone and then there's always the age old I'm um, just call on people oh I haven't heard from you Catherine can you share a little bit of what you think about this question or about this this idea and then you can always give people the right to pass so if somebody really doesn't want to share they can say pass and you can say all right I'll, I'll call on someone else um so yeah lots of different tips and tricks to have in your back pocket when dealing with some of these but some people are really persistent some people will just talk and talk <laughs> and talk over you as a facilitator we i have definitely dealt with that before too some some people just really want to be heard <laughs> any other thoughts before we move on to our last piece all right so the next piece that we're going to do is sort of like a a, a large group uh kind of brainstorm together um, so the way that this is going to work is we're going to share some Google Slides in the chat box. And we're going to share the link and I'm going to wait for you all to go into the Google Slides just to make sure you all have access. So there's the link to the Google Slides. I want to make sure you can click in and see the slides.
And my favorite part about Google Slides are like the little anonymous animals that pop up. So we've got a narwhal, a mink, a something that looks like a bull. How do you even say that? I don't know. And a leopard. <laughs> All right, so folks are in here. So there are five orange slides that say facilitation challenges. And then there are five kind of blue slides that say facilitation strategies. So the first thing we're gonna start with is we're gonna give you a few minutes to click into one of the first five slides that are in orange that talk about facilitation challenges. And so we've split them up into five different themes. So we have tech and logistics is one facilitation challenge. Uh, the second one is relationship building. The third one is engagement. The fourth one is problem solving and adapting. And the fifth one is sort of a general kind of bucket for other, any other sort of facilitation challenges. So we're gonna give you a few minutes to click into these slides and type in any challenges that you have in your facilitation or that you've run into as you're trying to lead meetings. What are things that are coming up for you that are, that are hard to navigate? Um, or any issues that you might have in your facilitation. So we're gonna play a little bit of music um, and give you some time to, to fill up these slides. And then together, we're gonna talk through some solutions or ways that, or some strategies we might use um, to address the challenges that you all brainstorm. So we'll give you about five minutes or so to click into the slides and add your own challenges. So if you think about your meetings and your facilitation, what are some things that have come up for you um, that fall into these themes. And if they don't fall into the themes, feel free to add it to the other. Some of the thoughts that you all shared around some facilitation challenges around tech and logistics include screen sharing, miscommunication about tech availability, does the host have the cords and connecting laptops, um, adding co-hosts to prevent uh, like a meeting ending or any glitches. Um, so many tech issues, people can't hear, poor internet connection, uh, people keep freezing, and then participants not muting themselves and interrupting the host with background noise. Uh, so if we go down to slide six for facilitation strategies, things you might use in order to address some of those challenges, you all have put some stuff on here. So let's talk through some of these. Um, you can plan which specific tech pieces will be used or compatible. So doing some prep ahead of time, um, that could be really helpful. Doing a tech run through, right? Plugging in all the things, making sure that the host and co-host um, understand where and how to do all the things, right? Connecting and, and making sure that they can log on. They have the login information, the password. Um, they know how to work the back end of Zoom um, and create breakout rooms, things like that. All of that is really helpful um, because if they don't, a tech run through can help them feel a little bit more comfortable with clicking all the buttons and connecting all the things, right? Having multiple co-hosts and delegated roles. So perhaps the host is just focusing on facilitation and you have somebody else doing tech and logistics um, and talking through that with the folks that are gonna be leading the meeting. Um, saving your presentation or materials in PDF or on personal email, just in case you can't open it on work email, right? Having different folks have, having different access. So for example, in today's meeting, when Victoria lost Wi-Fi, I had the slides open, Paula had the slides open, and I can bet that Allison, who was our, our backup, also had the slides open. So at any moment, any of us can just hit the share button and have it ready. Um, but before that, we had to all make sure that we had the most recent version of the slides because Paula and I put the slides together. We saved the slides in our in our training folder, everyone has access to that folder um, and knows where all the things are. So all of that takes prep, right? Or at least a conversation to be like, do you know where everything is? Do you have access to it? Is everybody clicked in? Um, it's part of our routine as we're setting up training. So all of those um, are really, really helpful. Does anybody have any other sort of tech tips or logistical things that you find really helpful as a facilitator? Um, I'm curious around this screen share piece. Does somebody wanna share what that sort of challenge is when it comes to screen sharing? Do you just like find it really hard to screen share? Um, or yeah, what what is coming up for you when you think about the challenges around screen sharing? I think one thing I could say about that is um, 
for example, for, for Zoom, you just have to make sure that you're on the, the right screen mm. before you share because sometimes you, or you go to Zoom, you share, and then you are sharing the wrong screen. And then maybe your private, uh, I don't know, whatever you have on the screen at the time might be the wrong screen. And then that's the first thing people will see. So just make sure that um, you have uh, what you want to share on that screen. Before you, or you, you probably have to close every other document and just have one document open up. Absolutely. So yeah, being able to do a tech run through is really helpful. And there are different sort of share options. So like what if you're leading a meeting and you go to the share button um, on the screen, you can just share your screen and you'll get kind of a preview of the screen that you're sharing. Um, and then there's also advanced sharing options. So you can share a portion of your screen. You can share your screen and your sound if you're trying to play a video for your folks. So there are def definitely uh, pluses to doing a tech run through so that you can try some of those things out. And what does that look for? Or what does that look like when you do share a portion of your screen or sharing sound at the same time as you're sharing your screen and kind of walk through anything that might come up for that. I am a big believer in having two screens as a facilitator, especially if you're doing a facilitation regularly over Zoom. Um, I have you all, my computer laptop is where I'm looking at the screen when I'm talking, but my slides, my agenda that has my talking points is on my other screen. Um, and so when we set up prep for this meeting, um, we ha I had somebody else sharing slides because I can't look at my talking points and my facilitator's guide if I'm sharing slides, right? Because if I pull that screen up, it's going to also share, um, it's going to also share my guide, which would defeat the purpose, right? I want you all to look at the slides and I want myself to see the talking points. So being able to, to navigate those screens um, is really helpful. And if you can swing it, having somebody else share the slides so that you can focus on the things that you need to focus on. Um, so I find some of those pieces really helpful. Any other thoughts about facilitation challenges when it comes to tech? All right, so let's go to slide two, facilitation challenges around relationship building. We have creating standards for meeting facilitation across leaders, connecting meeting participants to other participants with similar goals, trying to get invited to meetings hosted by people with similar goals, and too many silos. Groups are doing similar work, but they're not connecting and they're not collaborating. So some of the strategies that you all came up with are mapping strengths across facilitators and dele delegating tasks, right? So having the conversation with other folks um, and trying to see sort of what makes uh, sense for, for each facilitator. Um, icebreakers and interactive questions to get people to connect um, and doing a pulse test on groups via polls in the meeting as a way to kind of gauge um, what are ways that we can connect people and get them sort of talking about some of their similar goals and strategies when they're doing work in the meeting. Other thoughts around relationship building, strategies that you use or tips that are really helpful. One of the things that I find generally helpful is that, so when we were talking about like presence and style as facilitators, I am an internal processor. I tend to be one that's kind of, if I'm a participant, I am quiet in the meeting. I am like thinking through all the questions. If I am raising my hand to speak, it's because I have a lot of internal thoughts going on and I want to share, but mostly I, I tend to sort of sit in the silence of things or sit with the quiet as I process. But I... It's not that style or that presence is not always helpful as a facilitator. So knowing who I am as a participant, I think can be helpful in how I show up as a facilitator because then I'm required to kind of turn myself up 110% when I show up in front of a room, right? Because I want my group to be able to engage. I want them to be able to build relationships for one another. So I wanna be able to think through what are ways that I can get people up and moving and connecting um, and so part of that is really thinking through how I am showing up as a facilitator to help create that space for others. So yes, interactive questions are really important. Icebreakers are really helpful. Um, talking through ways that you can think ahead of time, like this person is working on this and this person is working on that. So when I do small group work, I want to make sure that they're in a group together, 
right? So doing some of that thinking ahead of time and prepping myself as a facilitator to be uh, more energetic or more interactive or bringing myself out a little bit more so that I can allow my group to do that as well. So just some considerations for you all to make. All right, let's keep it moving. So slide three is facilitation engagement challenges, lack of consistency with participants who show up to meetings, no one talks or engages or contributes to the meeting, and a majority of participants have video off. So the strategies that you all shared are using a Jamboard or Google to make it less boring, right? Get to get sort of people contributing at all different levels having music during the quiet parts of a presentation or when you're waiting people to join. Um, and it depends on the type of meeting. Uh, we've been doing sort of lo-fi music, so, so it's kind of chill, but I have been to meetings where I show up and I'm, we're doing sort of the waiting time and they're playing like disco music in the beginning or they're playing musical music. And that brings out a whole nother part of me and I get excited. I'm like, oh, I know this song or this is really funny. It creates a space of connection, right? And so sometimes you can do that through music and it works really well. Sometimes you can do it through sort of an interactive question that you're having people connect. Um, so just being thoughtful about those pieces. What are you asking people to bring to the meeting or what are you asking them to share? How are you asking them to show up um, when it comes to some of these engagement pieces? Anything else that folks want to add to this in terms of strategies for engagement? When I go to a meeting that has a lot of cameras off, one, I like to say and have the group agreement for online meetings. Like if you can share your video, please do. Um, or have folks, if we're doing breakout rooms, um, I have folks share, like if you can't share in the large group, fine, but let's share in small groups so that when folks are talking to you in small groups, they can see your face. <laughs> um, so I find that to be helpful. And if uh, a lot of cameras are off during the meeting, I try to turn up the turn up the engagement via all other forms. So I'm having people do breakout rooms. I'm having people answer in the chat box. I'm having people unmute themselves. So I'm turning up all the other engagement elements if the camera um, is not an option for folks. Um, any other thoughts or questions about those? Wonderful. So the other challenge piece that we're going to go over is slide number four, problem solving and adapting. So adjusting the plan when something doesn't work or is missing and having a backup plan and multiple members who can take over. So some of the strategies that you all talked about was having at least one other person um, have the presentation or be available to contribute. What else can we do as facilitators to be ready when something comes up. Anybody have any other thoughts? Does anybody have anybody in their group, like a participant that's like really organized or really helpful with timing that you can like, if you don't have a co-facilitator, you can definitely ping your participants to help support. Like if you have that ask of folks, Be like, hey, do you mind kind of having this on the back end in case I'm worried about tech? Can you have these slides? And and leading on your participants um, to, to provide some of that. There is someone in our community who, um, and she's very graceful about it, but she'll be like, just wanna let you know you have five minutes left. Like if people are taking turns speaking. <laughs> gotta love a good timekeeper and that and that is really really helpful and being able to just like we mentioned earlier about kind of being honest with your audience about what you've got going on so being able to say like hey I would really love somebody to keep me on time because we when we get into an issue or a topic area I know we all get really excited and passionate and we end up talking and talking and we can stay on this topic forever but if somebody can give me like a five minute warning that'll help me kind of stay to our agenda and, and being able to lean, and it gives them a little bit more ownership, right? When they're able to uh, support you in that way and support the, the moving of the meeting as well. So I wanna thank you all for this. I'm gonna leave, what we're gonna do is when we share the slides and all the things that we've added to the chat box, I think we're sharing slides, we're sharing the pop 
agenda template. Um, and we're also going to share the Google meeting slide. So I'm going to update this with some of the things that we talked about. And then I'm going to turn off the editing feature so you all can have sort of the the ideas that you all shared in this meeting and just have it moving forward so nobody messes with it. Um, so those are some of the resources that we're gonna share with you today. Thank you all so much for taking the time to meet with us and to talk through some of these pieces. Um, I am going to let you all review some of the additional strategies and tips when we share the slides and let you know that we have another meeting coming, or excuse me, another training coming up called policy, Policy Systems and Environmental Change, so PSE Change, that's happening on October 17th, um, and it's going to be an online training as well, and registration is open for that. If you're not already signed up for our newsletter, please sign up, and I think the last piece before we close out is to make sure to fill out your feedback form, which has been dropped into the chat box. And your feedback is always incorporated into the next training, making sure we're keeping these as engaging as possible. Um, and it helps inform the types of trainings that we bring every year. So we take all of your feedback to help inform what we have going on for the rest of our training year. So thank you all so, so much for joining us today to talk about effective meeting facilitation. It's been a wonderful conversation and you will hear from us shortly when we follow up with all of our resources. And you can scan the QR code for the next, uh, for the feedback form as well. Thank you all so much. We've got one minute to spare. Thank you so much. Appreciate you all being here.